Hi, how are you? My name is Robert, and from now on I thank you for watching this video, in which I am going to explain the concepts of active power, reactive power and apparent power from a graphic point of view. But before continuing, I would like to ask you not to forget to drop a like if you find this video interesting, in that way, I will program new videos on this topic. And if you want to receive notifications of new videos, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and activate the notification bell. In an electrical installation, we will have a voltage source that feeds, through the distribution lines, a series of electrical loads, such as lights, motors, computers, etc., giving rise to the appearance of electrical currents. These electrical loads will develop an action such as generating light, displaying data on a computer screen or moving a product thanks to a motor, that is, there is an energy transmission, and thus we can speak of the concept of electrical power as the amount of work done per unit of time. When we have an electrical circuit, the voltages and currents can vary over time, for example, in a 50 Hz alternating voltage circuit, the voltage oscillates 50 times per second. Given this variation, we can speak about instantaneous voltages, currents and powers, wanting to indicate that they are considered at a specific precise moment, so, we are not talking about RMS values that require a certain time to be calculated. Taking into account this concept of instantaneous values, the instantaneous power in a circuit is calculated multiplying the instantaneous voltage by the instantaneous current. Where the lowercase, t, in the formula, implies, precisely, that these are instantaneous values, not RMS values. Now, we can look at the relationship between voltage and current waveforms, in order to study later the power. Suppose an electric circuit with a 50 Hz alternating power supply, and we are going to consider as loads, an ideal resistance and an ideal coil. We could also use a capacitor, that is also a linear load and produces reactive power too. But for simplicity we will consider just a resistor and an inductance. For this type of loads, if the voltage is sinusoidal, the currents are also sinusoidal. This is what defines a linear load versus nonlinear loads, in which the current will not be sinusoidal, as it happens with electronic loads like frequency converters, rectifiers, etc. Let us first consider a resistance type load. In this case, the voltage and current waveforms are in phase, that is, the zero crossings and maximum values of the voltage and current waveforms coincide in time. If we now think of a coil, we see that the voltage and current waveforms are 90 degrees out of phase, that is, the maximum of the voltage coincides with the zero crossing of the current. In the image, we see that for a 50 Hz installation, this lag is 5 milliseconds, that is, a quarter of a cycle, and if we consider a circumference that is 360 degrees, a quarter of a cycle will be precisely, those 90 degrees that we had commented. In the case of an inductance, that is to say a coil, we see that the maximum of the current occurs a quarter of a cycle after the maximum of the voltage, so we say that in a coil the current lags behind the voltage. If instead of considering a coil, that is, an inductive load, we consider an ideal capacitor, that is, a capacitive load, then the current would also be 90 degrees out of phase with respect to the voltage, but in this case the maximum current would be produced before the maximum of the voltage, that is, in a capacitive circuit the current leads the voltage. This means that coils and capacitors give rise to opposite phase shifts, this being the basis for using capacitor banks in installations with many motors, in order to compensate for the inductive reactive power generated by motors in the installation. As indicated, for the simplicity of the study, we are going to focus only on inductive circuits, although the development of these concepts is also applicable to capacitive circuits. Now we can consider a combination of resistance and inductance, as happens for example in a motor, whose copper windings have a certain resistance and, given their coil-shaped construction they also have an inductance. In this case, the phase shift takes an intermediate value between 0 and 90 degrees, now the zero crossings and maximum values do not match each other. In the graph on the left, we see the waveforms of the voltage and current that an oscilloscope could display. These are, let's say, real waveforms, but in relation to the current waveform, 
Thanks to mathematics, we can decompose the current displayed by the oscilloscope, as the sum of two special currents, a current in phase with the voltage, which we can call active current, and another current 90 degrees out of phase with respect to the voltage, which we can call reactive current. This way of considering the current, will allow us to draw interesting conclusions in relation to the powers. Let us now see the graphs of the instantaneous power, which, as we have said, is calculated, simply multiplying voltage and current values for each instant. Let's start first with a resistive load, that is, a load in which the phase shift between voltage and current is zero degrees. Since voltage and current have the same sign at all times, both are positive if they are above the horizontal axis or negative if they are below the horizontal axis, their product will always be greater than or equal to zero. In other words, the graph of the instantaneous power is always above the horizontal axis, although, as we can see, it oscillates between zero and a maximum value. This aspect, that the instantaneous power is always greater than or equal to zero, means that in the case of a resistance, at each moment the energy flow is always from the source to the resistance. It never returns energy to the source. If we now consider an ideal coil as a load, that is, a load with a phase shift of 90 degrees, now there are moments when the voltage and the current have opposite signs, which gives rise to a negative power. As we can see in the lower left graph, the instantaneous power oscillates above and below the horizontal axis, that is, when it is positive, the coil takes energy from the source and when it is negative it transfers energy to the source, but its average value in time is zero, that is, an ideal coil, on average, does not consume energy. Let us now consider again a load combining a resistance and an inductance, as in a real motor. In this case, the phase shift between voltage and current will have, as we have already commented, an intermediate value, suppose, for example, 30 degrees. In this case, the instantaneous power no longer oscillates equally around the horizontal axis. There are times when it is negative, that is, energy is transferred to the network, and other moments when it takes energy from the network, but its average value will be positive, that is, energy is consumed and is transformed into work, in this case the resistance will dissipate heat, and for example, in a motor it will be generated some movement. Now, we can use the trick of decomposing the real current into active and reactive currents, and we can multiply these currents by the voltage, to obtain the lower center and right images. These would be respectively the active power, called P, and the reactive power, called Q. As we see, the active power P, is always greater than, or equal to zero, and represents the useful work done by the load, considering useful work as the generation of heat, movement, etc. On the other hand, we have the reactive power Q, with a mean value always equal to zero, and therefore, does not give rise to a total network. The reactive power Q, is a power that is put into play in the circuit to magnetize the coils of motors, transformers and in general, of any inductive load. The point-to-point -point summation of the active and reactive instantaneous power curves, gives rise to the apparent total power, called S, which is what we see in the graph on the left. However, when we use a power quality analyzer to analyze these powers, to simplify their study and to be able to quantify them, RMS values are used, but in this case, we cannot add them arithmetically, as they are really vectors, and as a consequence, for adding them, we must use a vector sum, considering the phase angle, phi, between voltage and current. For RMS values, we can obtain the following relationships involving voltages, currents and powers. The RMS apparent power is calculated just multiplying the RMS values of voltage and current. S equals VI. The RMS active power is calculated multiplying the apparent power by the cosine of phi, where phi is the phase angle between voltage and current, also called DPF. P equals S cos phi. Finally, the RMS value of the reactive power is calculated multiplying the apparent power by the sine of phi. Q equals S sen phi. The RMS value of the apparent power is then obtained through the square root of the sum of the RMS values of the active and reactive power both squared, as indicated in the following formula. 
expression representing the Pythagorean theorem for the well-known triangle of powers. Measuring these powers and energies with the Fluke 435 power quality analyzer is very easy. We simply press the menu key and select the power and energy function. And, in this way, the analyzer will automatically register a large number of power-related parameters. In addition to the power parameters, the instrument also records the RMS values of voltage and current. As I have already indicated, reactive power appears on inductive circuits, but also on capacitive circuits, and, in order to be aware of what type of reactive power we have, the Fluke 435 provides, for each phase, an icon or symbol, of a capacitor, or a coil, if the installation is capacitive or inductive, respectively. Up to now, we have been considering just a phase, but obviously, the instrument can provide not only the power per phase, but also the total power as shown in this figure. Since we cannot arithmetically add active power with reactive power, or apparent power, each one, is expressed in different units. Active power is measured in watts or kilowatts, apparent power in volt amps or kilovolt amps, and reactive power in reactive volt amps or reactive kilovolt amps. And so, we have reached the end of this presentation. And as I mentioned at the beginning, if this video has been interesting for you, don't forget to drop a like, so that I can know that you liked it, and I can program new videos on this topic. In a future video, we will see that, in addition to the active, reactive and apparent powers, two other additional powers can be defined, the harmonic power, and the unbalanced power. Being able to measure and analyze these powers is very important to be able to determine the most appropriate solution for each installation. So if you don't want to miss it, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and activate the notification bell. Thank you very much for watching this video and see you soon.